Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we are going to be talking about a huge victory and saving the receipts from the national media. Uh, We'll be also talking some baseball. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. The season is going to start real soon. We're about a month away or so. So don't sleep. Head on over to icehogs.com. Get yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, sign up for season tickets and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, how are you doing today? Much, much better with a Bears victory. A Bears victory show. Feels good to record one of those, doesn't it? And it it especially feels good when you record one early in a season in a regime that's not yet getting pushed out the door. Yes, it is not a, uh, it's not a hollow victory or, you know, uh, a luck victory. The bears, the bears won today. Um, you know, we, we could talk a lot about the, this is and the that's and the others and, oh, well, you know, George Kittle didn't play. Well, guess what? They had, they played the quarterback that they spent all last year grooming that they spent what three first round draft picks to get. They had use They had Debo Samuel. They had, uh, you know, their hall of fame, Bosa, Nick Bosa. Yeah. They had their hall of fame left tackle. Like they had their whole cadre of, of, uh, players and the bears were being lambasted by everybody as the worst team in the NFL. And the Bears had a rough first half, made adjustments, and they won this football game. I think the key for today's win, and this was the theme of the day, especially in the second half. Obviously, adjustments are a big part of it. We're going to talk about adjustments. It's a big part of what we want to look for, considering that's something we didn't see in the last regime where adjustments just simply weren't made. But really, what I saw today was a team that took advantage of the other team's mistakes. The other team, not the Bears, was making the big mistakes, and the Bears capitalized on pretty much all of it. Yeah, okay, they did recover a fumble early on, and they didn't score off that, but you know the San Francisco 49ers are deep into their territory, and if they don't recover that fumble, then they probably have at least a 14-0 lead at halftime, And, you know, you can look at the first half, too, and say, hey, they could have been down 17 to nothing or even more. You know, Trey Lance had a big overthrow down the sideline early in the game. You know, that kept them in the game, and the Bears took advantage of that because it's one thing to get, you know, gifts like that, bad penalties by the other team, bad turnovers by the other team, whatever, but you have to take advantage of it. And in many cases, when the Bears would get those mistakes in favor of them, you know, the other team would make the mistakes. They weren't able to capitalize. Today, they were able to capitalize. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about, uh, you talked about, you know, the, the other team's mistakes. But I want to point out, look at last year. How often were we talking about the Bears l- ending drives because of penalties, offensive penalties, pre-snap penalties, motion penalties, delay of game penalties. Mm -hmm. Did you see that this today? All we saw was a towel on the field. It, it it was literally, um, you had this bears team had so few penalties. 
and um and that that's not accidental what's what's the s in the hits principle situational smarts and i thought it was sausages but okay <laughs> but it's the uh you know the the bears were smart they didn't commit penalties they played disciplined football and that was the big difference there is uh you take away um you take away that towel penalty the stupid towel penalty and the bears i think had two penalties they had two legit penalties and it was nothing like egregious it wasn't a roughing the passer it wasn't a big defensive pass interference on a deep ball it wasn't anything like that i mean there was nothing really where you said wow that is so stupid and so undisciplined you know what that towel penalty what are the chances they're playing in those types of conditions again it was just a fluke thing and i think they learned their lesson don't dry anything have a towel on the field so i don't they, think that's really a big deal at the end they learned their lesson nobody nobody knew that was a penalty I don't think anybody knew that was a penalty. You're a towel. <laughs> it was, it was so crazy. Um, like I had no idea that that was, uh, was a penalty. And um, that was how much was that? How many yards was that? 15 yard penalty, 15 yard penalty. You know how many yards the bears had in penalties total, including the, including that penalty, 24 yards. Yeah. And I think the 49ers had way more than double that. The 49ers had 99 yards in penalties. Yeah. 12. That's, that's a whole field's worth. Yeah. And it's not even it's not even the, the yardage per se. It is uh the number. They had 12 penalties. And um they kept multiple drives alive too. Absolutely. And that is undisciplined football. And the Bears played disciplined football. That's why they were able to overcome. They had the one interception and, you know, I, I saw a lot of Twitter takes that it was a bad read. I don't think it was a bad read. I think it was a bad throw. It was probably a bad decision to make that throw, but I think he was trying to throw it over the top, you know, cause there was, there was sandwich, uh, you know, the, the wide receiver was, there was over the top coverage and underneath coverage. And I think he was trying to throw it in between. And in those conditions, it was not happening. Yeah, I, I don't like the decision at all there, but luckily it didn't end up costing them in the end because you did have Cole Komet open. Right. He had Cole Komet open and there was there was decent. I mean, there was good coverage, especially good coverage, considering that the conditions on the field, you know, but like you said, what are the chances of you getting these kind of conditions for the rest of the season? I mean, I woke up this morning and I looked outside and I thought that the world had shrunk and we were in somebody's shower. Like it was just coming down like crazy. And I mean, even during the game through a lot of it, when it wasn't raining, it was hard. It was still raining. And then towards the end, it was like another waterfall. So that field was getting just soaked the entire game. I mean, it looked like they were playing like on a soaked, mushy carpet that was let outside. It was crazy, the field conditions. I mean, you watch them with like squeegees just pushing water and and the field looked like a like a the bog of eternal stench out of labyrinth. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, when you saw them tackle guys towards the end of the game when the when they got the, the 49ers got the ball back with one minute to go and you pretty much knew it was over. I don't think Trey Lance could even see where his guys were. I mean, they just, you saw the water just splash up from the ground when anyone moved, you saw a little splash throughout the game. Obviously the, it was still wet throughout, but you saw the puddles really start to form all around the field to the point where you couldn't see the numbers of the lines. Yeah, it, it was so bad. Um, and I mean, I've seen some bad football conditions, but that might have been the worst. Um, you know, in in approximately ten years, we won't have that problem because we'll have a permanent dome. Well, yeah, you know what's funny is Arlington Heights is still trending. 
It's been trending all week because you had the meeting, the public meeting in Arlington Heights, which got really good feedback from the people. The people seem to be buying into it. I mean, this has been a big topic of conversation over the past few weeks, and everyone's like, it just so seals in the fact that they need a new stadium. And they spent the time putting in a new type of sod on Soldier Field. It was supposed to be new. It was supposed to be better. Oh, guess what? The Genesis Flood 2.0 rains happened to show up (laughs) on the one day they were going to play on it. Because you look at the forecast, there's like no other rain coming. But I do want to point out that even with that rain, the field was better than it usually is. I mean, you know, water, the, the, the underwaterness aside, the grass held. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I mean, it, it, much, it put, much, much better, much than, better than it, than it usually yep. does. Um, so that makes the old turf today. It would have been mud city. You would have taken one step and like somebody's foot would have sunk in like eight inches. Yeah. So the Bermuda grass, probably good option um, over the Kentucky bluegrass. So um, I don't know whose decision it was to, to make that call, but um, that would, that was a good one. I think. Cause that feel could have been way worse. Yeah, as bad as it was, and I think that it looked like it was perfect for sliding on at the end there. It was the perfect slip and slide grass. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it, it's funny. This was such a tale of two halves. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the first half, I, I want to read you the outcomes. Punt, interception. Punt, 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 and yards gained, negative seven, 23, three, four, three, 42. And um, that, that was, you know, absolutely no offense. And, and part of it is that, um, you know, there was some issues with uh, protecting the quarterback weren't weren't establishing the run and receivers were just not getting open. They were crowding the line of scrimmage. It was tough to throw and uh, they were so backed up. They were had conservative play calls because they were so backed up. Oh, the play calling was. Yeah. And, and, and listen, it's, you know, part of it is that, uh, you know, they were so backed up. They, they wanted to be conservative because it was going to be a low scoring game. Um, you know, you don't want to turn the ball over and give that the other team, a, you know, guaranteed three points on a turnover. I sort of get it. But at some point, if you're not able to get a drive going and flip the field, you were going to be, they were just going to pick you apart all day. Well, this is what this is what drove me the craziest through the first, I'd say, even three quarters, even when things started to get better. The 49ers were clearly shutting down David Montgomery up the middle. I mean, just he wasn't getting anything. And they kind of kept opting to do it. And then they finally implemented Khalil Herbert, who seemed to have a better, you know, grip with the ball on that turf. And just, you know, he was the better matchup for this particular game. And once they got him in the game, look what happened. Khalil Herbert got the insurance touchdown and he had a couple of good runs. I mean, you look at the day of rushing stats, leading rusher was Khalil Herbert, 45 yards, nine carries, average five yards a carry. David Montgomery had 17 carries and managed 1.5 average yards per game. So that's, and only 26 yards total. So you saw a lot of just running up the middle of Dave Montgomery that wasn't getting anywhere. And finally, when they adjusted to using Khalil Herbert more, you saw better results. Yeah. And, and I, you know, part of that, I, I'm not going to say Khalil Herbert, the better running back or, you know, the had the better day. I mean, clearly stats wise, um, you know, I, I think, there was probably a few factors in there. They switched up the types of runs they had. Um, Khalil Herbert saw the lanes, um, you know, 
they were they were really just getting in the backfield and hammer and poor David Montgomery. Right. Um, I'm not saying Montgomery is worse than Khalil Herbert. In most cases, I want Montgomery as my number one back. But I just think in this case with the matchup and I, I think that Khalil Herbert just looked better running on that wet, soggy turf than Montgomery did. Montgomery just looked a, a step or two slow to me. Yeah, it's uh, but you, you got to ride the hot hand. Um, and, uh, you know, but the second half, so in the first half you had, um, you know, the, the, uh, 49ers got out early and, um, and they got the, and the whole time, all I could hope was, man, the bears just absolutely need to, uh, flip the field flip the field flip the field because they're if as long as they have their backs to their own end zone this is going to be a long day and uh um and then finally the bears were able to sustain a drive i mean they got they got a little bit lucky but you know what happened was they started rolling justin fields out and letting justin fields gain some Mm -hmm. confidence with his feet with his legs mm-hmm. and when you saw that you're like okay he's moving now and and once once he is able to make plays then and get his confidence things are going to get better and we saw that the the Dante Pettis uh touchdown was an absolute broken play and I, I saw Packer fans crying it was a broken play is a broken play but you know what he could it's- have easily gotten his ass kicked uh, Justin Fields on that play. He had to run all the way back. It it doesn't when you it's sometimes broken plays happen because of what you're doing. Like mm-hmm. you like the Packers, you think it's luck all the time that there's broken plays? No, they design things to confuse defenses and cause broken plays. There's, that's why you see the Chiefs have so many broken plays. That's why when Tom Brady played on the on the Patriots there was so many broken plays because they do things to create mismatches or to cause confusion is Justin Fields legs caused that broken play is you saw David Montgomery on that play Justin Fields I'm talking with my hands like somebody can see me Justin Fields rolls out to the left David Montgomery goes into the flat and starts going towards him the man that was supposed to have Dante Pettis rolled out because the obvious thought is that's the throw you're going to try to make is to David Montgomery, mm-hmm, not like throw, a jump off, yeah, not throw across your body to the other side of the field. And but Justin Fields has a really strong arm. We've seen how hard he works to reposition his body rolling that way that he's not throwing it. You know, the when they say don't throw across your body like that. It's because it's all an arm throw. But if you watch, he pivots his body now. So he completely pivots his body. So it's, it's, he's throwing all the way across the field, but he's throwing with better mechanics. He throws it all the way over there and the nobody is around Dante Pettis. And, and what's even better about that is uh, Equinemius St. Brown made the block on that play that Mm -hmm. got it to be a touchdown rather than, just a big play. Equinemius St. Brown had quite himself a Bears debut. He caught the game-winning touchdown. He blocked well. You know, maybe there's something in him. You know, he kind of seemed like just like a, a nobody cast off from Green Bay. But, you know, now that he has a chance to be a bigger part of an offense, you know, maybe there could be something there. I was really impressed with him today. I was too. Um, I mean, he was willing to block. He was actually blocking. He made some nice plays. I think part of what happened in Green Bay was he fell out of favor with Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know if you watched the Packers game today. I did. But Aaron Rodgers, when he, he punishes receivers, uh, is the, the first play of the game. Uh, Christian Watson had a touchdown in his hands. There was nothing but, you know, green grass and end zone in front of him. And he dropped the ball, hit him right in the hands, dropped the ball. And 
you didn't see Aaron Rodgers go back to him until the fourth quarter. And that was the first offensive play of the game. He did not go back to him. He punishes players. And I'm, I'm guessing, you know, equanimous St. Brown somehow wound up in his doghouse and there wasn't a need to go to him because you had, uh, you know, yeah, you had Devonte Adams. You had Devonte Adams, arguably the best wide receiver in football. You didn't mm-hmm. need to go back to him. Right, exactly. I mean, you saw how Devonte Adams and Rodgers, those two alone, could just take over a game. And you know, even so, you had Alan Lazard ahead of him too. So it was kind of tough. Where you know, now he's got that opportunity, and you know, he he worked with Luke Getzey in Green Bay. So you know, I my hope is that Luke Getzey brings the most out of Equinemia St. Brown. Uh, because that would be a big win to have him be something. You know, obviously Darnell Mooney really wasn't a factor today. And it was really Equinemius St. Brown and Dante Pettis that, you know, had the big catches and the big plays. But, you know, if Darnell Mooney is Darnell Mooney going for, and I think he will be, I think he will be. I'm not really worried about, you know, lack of targeting and production today. Uh, he had the one deep ball attempt to him, but he was just really well covered. Uh, So I'm not too worried about that, but if under him, you have several reliable guys, you have Equinemius St. Brown doing what he did today. You have Dante Pettis being a reliable guy. And then if you get Valus Jones Jr. back at some point, and then you mix Brian Pringle in there, well, then, you know, you can make something work out of that decently, I think. So it was a really big win to see what Equinemius St. Brown can do because you need all the depth you can get at wide receiver. Yeah, I'm not worried about Darnell Mooney at all. Not no, even a little no, bit. No, 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 no. It's, um, you know, they covered him with Charvarius Ward um, and the sloppy field conditions. You weren't throwing it deep. He's he's not going to be an underneath guy. Um, they didn't really target him very much because they weren't throwing, throwing deep balls. Um, I think they tried like what? One really deep ball, that one that was to him that he was guarded really yeah. well. Yeah. And it was, um, it just went out of bounds and it was like, you're like, okay, whatever. But, um, you know, you're going to see him next week, really, really try to work it with him. Uh, I was shocked that we didn't see, um, more targets to Cole Komet. Yeah. Considering I mean, did he even get a target today. I think they, they, he got one target, no catches. I think they mostly kept those tight ends in to block because um because of the field conditions. The, the field conditions yeah. and the pass rush of that uh that 49ers front. That front, 49ers front is no joke. No, no. Havanga, Mike, I, that that guy's insane. Yeah, that guy, that guy was legit all over the place. He and Joey Bosa was everywhere. Um you know, Fred Warner had himself a nice game, but you know, Nick Bosa was was just everywhere. And I don't even think like pass rush wise, he didn't do anything. I mean, he was good, but he was not exceptional. I mean, I he thought, didn't record like the sack numbers, but there was the pressure there. Yeah, I mean, I I think that uh Braxton Jones actually did a fairly decent job. Um you know, the one time that Joey Bosa really got him was he fooled him. He he started to do an, a, a pass rush move that it was like a speed move to the outside. And then he ended up bull rushing on the inside and caught Braxton Jones off off balance and just drove him backwards. Um, And but but really, Braxton Jones did a nice job. Um, We saw Cody Whitehair did a pretty nice job. And Sam Mustafa ended up starting at center. Tevin Jenkins started at right guard, but at some point they moved. They were they were bringing Tevin Jenkins and uh, Patrick Lucas or, uh, or Lucas Patrick back and forth. They were doing swapping, um, and then you know Lucas Patrick ended up playing right guard with a club on his hand. Um. But overall, I think the Bears offensive line they had their struggles in the beginning, but they they made it work in the second half. You saw um, the the offensive play calling roll them out a little. Justin Fields out a little more. Um, 
They gave a little more protection on, you know, chips uh, on the edge rushers. Um, you know, I, I, I really thought that, um, you know, you, you saw, you saw a much better performance in the second half, which is amazing to see because we've spent the last like four years watching second half lack of adjustments. Well, yeah, it was kind of like the opposite of what we saw. We had fun in the first half and then collapsed in the second half. It was kind of the other way around in this case. Well, it wasn't kind of, it really was the other way around in this case. And I feel like the second that Dante Pettis made that catch and they were able to get that touchdown, you felt the game change because what happened? They got a stop. And then they scored again. And I believe it was the first play. Justin Fields connected with a nice pass towards the sideline to Byron Pringle. So they were already on the move. It kind of felt like maybe Justin Fields needed that one big play to kind of build some confidence in him because felt a little bullish at times before there was one uh, kind of dump pass that he tried to do. I don't remember who it was to but it was a simple dumb pass and he just completely missed them. He just looked completely rattled. This was before the Pettis touchdown. And then once he threw that touchdown pass, felt like the confidence level just really, really shifted. Not only with Justin Fields, but the whole team, because when they took the lead and that energy came back in the stadium, you saw how fired up that Bears team was both on the field and on on the sidelines. Well, just watch the, you know, the, the body language of the defensive players after the bears scored that first touchdown, they, they were riled up and they were, you know, excited and jumping around and throwing their hands in the air. Yep. And, mm-hmm. um, and you could just, you saw the momentum shift and you saw the 49ers act like they didn't belong. And, you know, I, I really want to punch the first person that says, well, the 49ers really had tough time in those weather conditions. We had the same weather yeah. conditions. If everybody played in those same conditions. You know, you, just one team, one team played smarter and played more uh, balanced and more uh, disciplined. And the other one didn't is the 49ers bailed the bears out several times with you know, roughing plays with penalties. And it was nice to see the bears play so well, Um, you know, defense defensively Jaquan Brisker had a really nice game. Yeah, Uh, he did. uh, There was a, there was one missed tackle that, you know, he obviously going to go back and, and, you know, bring that up on him. Uh, Kyler Gordon, I thought played pretty well. He had the one play where, you know, he just had, a rookie brain fart moment and, and got beat bad on a play, but overall you saw a nice, a nice play. Uh, Eddie Jackson started off that first half pretty bad mm-hmm. and turned it around in the second half. That pick was huge. I mean, I think that pick took any life that the 49ers had just sucked it out of them. You know, the, the game had already shifted big time. The bears had taken the lead and then that pick, to not only get the turnover, but bring it deep into the 49ers territory. That was a deflating, deflating play for the 49ers. It was so big for Jackson to come up with that pick. But I, I tweeted about this, but you know, I see why the 49ers wanted Trey Lance, why they believe in Trey Lance and why he's the future of this franchise or there's a quarterback situation is he's mobile. He knows the playbook and he's got a really good arm. Um, you know, and, and I know bears fans want so badly to all the other quarterbacks in this, that, that same draft class to fail, except for Justin Fields. But I don't, it doesn't need that. It doesn't need to be that way for, um, you know, for, for us to love Justin Fields is Justin Fields can be a great quarterback and, you know, not have to have a, you know, a Trubisky uh, 
Patrick Mahomes situation. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, you know, this, this matchup was, was fun to see, but honestly, this game was less about Trey Lance and more about Justin Fields leading his team. Is this Justin Fields won this football game with his arm and with his legs? Yeah. And I mean, look at the situation you had too. I mean, 10, nothing at the time when they took the 10, nothing lead, it felt like they were down 30 to nothing with the way the offense wasn't doing anything with the way just the overall team and energy felt, it looked so big. And then they were able to flip that script so much. I mean, you heard them say over and over on the broadcast how much the 49ers controlled that game. They controlled that game through the first, I'd say, three and a half quarters. I mean, again, until the, the Pettis touchdown, they, they had control that game. But what was key in that? The Bears stayed in it. They weren't down 17 nothing like they easily could have been. They were down 7 nothing and 10 to nothing. They didn't get it to a two touchdown deficit and then they were able to come back and do it. I mean, once once everything shifted, you believed in Justin Fields more. I think Justin Fields believed in himself and you saw the playbook open up a little bit. You saw Justin Fields roll out, you saw play action on the Equinemius St. Brown touchdown. That's what we've been wanting to see and we finally saw it and I hope that Going forward, we see more of that stuff early on because, let's be real, as bad as they look this week, you can't go into Green Bay next week and start off the same way. No, no, you can't. And and listen, you know, we're all having a blast laughing at Green Bay and how bad they sucked. Uh, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Look what happened to them last year. They took an ass whooping week one and bounced back. and. That defense of theirs is good. Aaron Rodgers is good. But the big difference is they don't have Devontae Adams. And Devontae Adams is what made that offense elite because you he, you couldn't do certain things because he was an absolute weapon that could play any – that you could line him up anywhere on that you know wide receiver. You could line him up inside – is in the slot. You can line him up outside. You can flip fields and he could go wherever and create mismatches. And, and you saw this. It was funny because the, the Vikings did the same thing to the Packers that the Packers have done to everybody else, except they use Justin Jefferson instead of Devonte Adams. Right. And the gave the Packers fits. Um, you know, the Packers will figure it out. I think Christian Watson does look good. Just his man. He had some dropsies today, uh, mm-hmm. but you know, he's, he is not Devonte Adams. N- nobody really is Devonte Adams. Like, let's be real. I mean, I think the Packers are still going to win 11 ish games and they're still going to win the division and they're still probably going to own us, but that offense is not the same without Devontae Adams. It's just not. You can make it work. You can make it good. It could be fine. You have one of the best quarterbacks ever on that team. Everything could be just fine. But to say it's the same as it was with Devontae Adams, it's not. It's just not. Yeah. So, um, you know, but Bears Bears have to – they have to figure out a few things before next week's game because that – that Packers defense is no joke. They're real. No, good. it's not. It's not. And I mean, Justin Jefferson is unreal. You know, as much as we like Darnell Mooney, he's not even in the same league as Justin Jefferson. And again, few people are. It's no disrespect to Darnell Mooney, but when you have a weapon like him, that's um, really tough to beat no matter who you are. And the Bears don't really have that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's like five or six elite, maybe seven elite wide receivers in this league. And then there's that second tier. And Darnell Mooney is at the top of that second tier. And that's, that is not even a knock. That is just 
you know, that's a real good position to be in, but uh, you know, he's not the same as, as a Devonte Adams or a Justin Jefferson or a, um, uh, the guy from Cincinnati or uh, AJ Brown, or, you know, there's just a handful of guys that are just elite game changers. Yep. And Justin Jefferson is one of those guys. Yep. Um, the one good thing is there was uh, one of the linebackers for the Packers, Kawhi Walker, who looked real good. He was everywhere. And I'm not going to speculate. He left that game with a shoulder injury, but his shoulder was dangling down. I'm not going to be surprised if he didn't break his collarbone. Ugh, that, ugh. I mean, the way when he ran off the field, his arm was dangling down like he c- couldn't support it up and he was in pain. Um, I mean, it could have been a dislocation of the shoulder, but um, they said that he was not coming back in. And uh, that guy had he only played like. Like not even three full quarters and he was second to the Packers and tackles and hit eight tackles. Um, and I don't want to wish injury upon anybody, but if he's out next week, that's kind of a break for the bears. It's a huge break for the bears. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I like the direction things are moving. I like, I like seeing we're seeing more and more of the tip of the iceberg of what a real quarterback looks like is you can't at this point. Now you can't tell me that Justin Fields is going to be a bust or a failure. No, I mean, it's, you know, again, it's easy to overreact in the first half. And was I overreacting a little bit? Yeah, probably at at some points, but Um, You know, he showed you what his physical attributes can allow him to do. And look, the play he made on the Pettis touchdown, how many Bears quarterbacks could make that play? Honest to God. Uh, History? None. Yeah. Justin Fields. There you go. And and Mitch Trubisky was a very good athletic quarterback, but I don't think he would have been able to do that. No, no. Jay Cutler was a good athletic quarterback but i don't think he he makes that throw i think he tries to force underneath and he he had such bad mechanics when he scrambled that i don't even think he would have got the ball there probably not is i was so impressed in the preseason when you watch justin fields roll out watch him when he's running to the if he when he goes to throw it the other direction he flips his hips so he's still throwing with good throwing mechanics and, and, you know, that like, there was some That's air so under important. that ball. There was air under that ball, but that ball, that ball was not an errant throw. So that was a perfectly good throw. And there's no one else guy. around him. Yep. No one's intercepting that ball. There is no time for anyone to get there and intercept that ball. He was on an Island all by himself. Yeah. So I, I just was very impressed, you know, Justin Fields did have a rough first half, but you know, so much of that was uh, the weather and the pass rush and the, they couldn't establish the run. Um, I, I'm, you know, the, the one thing I'm going to say is I really hope that Lucas Patrick's thumb is ready to go. Mm-hmm. Because if you can kick him back to center, I I think I think that's your five best guys is Braxton Jones, Cody Whitehair, Lucas Patrick, Tevin Jenkins, and Larry Borum. I agree. I agree. That's going to be important. And, you know, one more thing I'll add about Justin Fields is props to him for continuing to play well in the second half after he got that helmet to helmet. You know, that's, that's, that's a jarring, it might not have looked like much in real time, but if you slowed it down and I don't think he was doing the the defender, it just, you know, unfortunate it happened. It's obviously a flag. It needed to be flagged, but a helmet to helmet like that, 
that that's a tough shot to take and for fields to brush it off and keep going. You got to give him props. Absolutely. And Justin Fields actually got two calls for uh late hit. And it's nice because early in the preseason and all of last year, he was not getting those calls and he got two of them. And the first one, I'll be honest. It's when it happened live, I was like, throw the flag, throw the flag. And the flag came out. I was like, you know, thank God the flag came out. And then it was a little ticky it, tacky. Yeah. It is honestly, I went back and replayed it live. There was a sound, a cracking sound. I think they called it off the sound because it looked like the guy hit him and there was a cracking sound. I don't know who, you know, who hit who, but it was not the defender hitting Justin Fields. I think it was the people that were uh, yeah, around it's, him. But yeah. you definitely heard, you definitely heard a cracking sound like shoulder pad to shoulder pad or helmet to shoulder pad. And they heard that cracking sound and saw what looked like a hit. They threw the flag. And, and honestly, you can't go back and, and review that. So it, I'm glad I would rather them because I would rather them err on that throwing the flag than invite more players to, to try to get cheap shots in. I agree. And you know, it's kind of funny. Speaking of which, you also got a nice penalty called against the 49ers on a push off and off Kyler Gordon. Kyler Gordon didn't do the pushing off. It was who, who was the 49ers receiver? I don't remember. But either way, it really wasn't much of a push off. But Kyler Gordon kind of acted like it. He kind of jolted back to make it look like a push off and was able to draw that flag. Like, that's a nice little touch right there. I mean, you know, it's, it's just the announcer said it's like you, on the rule like to that is a push off and they they say it might have been ticky tack but honestly i thought the officiating was pretty good like were there a few like the first the first roughing call that justin fields got that that wasn't a roughing but made up for a lot of missed ones in the past but it wasn't egregious like you the guy the defender came over the top of him you heard like the cracking sound, like there was a collision, just wasn't the collision between those two. So I was like, I get it. That I get why they called it. It made sense. That is a, a fast judgment call in pouring rain. But overall, I thought they made good calls. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm flabbergasted about the toweling penalty. But once I knew that was a rule, I was like, all right, I get it. Like I get why they called it. I just had literally never heard that rule. Um, but that was don't think it's going to be a problem going forward. Yeah, that was that was arguably the best officiated game I've seen in a long time, especially with a game involving the Bears. That was, uh, you know, knock on wood. I hope we get officiating that good all season is because everything that happened, even if it was ticky tack or not, it was it was not egregious. It was I see what they were. I see what they called. They called that offensive pass interference because uh, they they saw the defender get moved one direction and the the receiver go the opposite direction to make the play. That is, that's the definition of off offensive pass interference. You know, even if there was some acting involved, they saw the defender move the opposite direction to create space. Like I get it. Like every, everything was good. The, the, the challenge flag on, um, the bears tight end when he caught the pass and they said he didn't pr- complete the process. I knew that was going to get overturned once they like when he caught it, I was like, Oh man, I just, I just assumed that they were not going to throw a flag because who's going to challenge a four yard reception, but the 49ers did. And I was like, yeah, yeah, they did it right away. Yeah. I'm like, that's totally getting overturned. He didn't complete it through the process. His feet were in bounds. Yeah. The feet were perfectly finely placed, but yeah. And, but like, again, like, was that a miss by the officials? Probably, but it wasn't like they, they were watching the feet to make sure his feet were in bounds. And then when he landed, like he dropped the ball, but they were watching for the positioning of the feet, which is, you know, in the bad weather, that's what they're really concerned about. So like I, I thought the officiating was officiating was actually pretty darn good. And I I beat the officials up really, you know, hard when they make mistakes. But 
I'm going to give them credit. I thought this was a well-officiated game. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing egregious. There really, really wasn't. And I mean, again, part of that too, it helps when the Bears play such disciplined football. And what did I talk about all preseason? I praised how disciplined they played, and they've continued to do that. It makes a huge difference, especially in the modern-day NFL, where so much is getting called. The less you are flagged, just the automatic, your chances of winning are better. Because one bad play can completely change a drive in a game, whether it's getting another first down or the chunks of yardage you get. I mean, look, the one bad penalty by the Bears, which was something we didn't know about because it was, you know, a freaking towel on the field. How often do you see that? That's a 15-yard penalty. If you're making those kind of penalties a lot more often, 15 yards is a big chunk of yards. And more often than not, it's going to result in the first down. So if it's, you know, obviously if you're the defense gets called on it, but you know where I'm getting with this. If you stay out of the ref throwing flags, I want to say stay out of the penalty box. I couldn't really think of an equivalent <laughs> of that, but you know what I mean? I'm going to be honest with you. The 15 yard toweling penalty. I was not real mad at it because, uh, Cairo Santos was not feeling kicking in that weather. And if he kicks that and misses it, you know, the, they get it from the spot of the kick, not from the line of scrimmage. So it, and with more time left. Yeah. It's punt it, flip that field position. And I think that was the right choice. And the, you know, the penalty reinforced that. So I was not mad at that penalty at all. Um, I was real nervous about that kick. And then the toweling penalty, I was like, and I, I, I was annoyed at the towel penalty. And then I, but I simultaneously breathed, breathed the sigh of relief because I didn't want them to try to kick that. Um, so it, it ended up working out. Yeah. Uh, and you know, just to, just to touch a little bit on Santos, you know, bad weather conditions, wind like the first the first extra point I think the wind took that one the second one was kind of in his head you mentioned this earlier on Twitter and he kind of just pulled a little bit but it it wasn't a good day for Santos he didn't really want him kicking much but overall I'm not worried about him you You know know, having trouble with it I'm not worried yeah that first one watch I think a big gust of wind took because if you watch it's going and it was sure it was a little bit off to the right but it would have been it would have been a clean kick. And then suddenly this gust of wind just and pushed it off. And the second one, I think he tried to just overcorrect it and, and he didn't get that gust of wind to straighten it out and just pushed it off to the side. Um, And, you know, I'm not, I'm not justifying, you know, he should, he's a professional kicker. He should still be making these kicks. Robbie gold was making the kicks, but, uh, I, I see what happened and um, you know, I'm not worried in the long run. Like I said, like we both said, the, this type of rain is, is not the norm. And uh, you know, he'll be, he'll be fine. He kicked fine last year on in soldier field. Yeah, he did. And uh, one other thing about kicking was it was really nice that, as much as I love Robbie Gold, we didn't have to hear the whole Robbie Gold freaking storyline again, which is brought up every time they play the Bears. Nobody brought it up. He didn't have to. Yeah. He didn't make any big kicks. And there was an article coming out about how he was going to play all pissed off today because of what happened. And, you know, Robbie Gold has still shown that he loves Chicago, loves the Bears fans. Hell, he was at the Bears playoff game against the Eagles. He bought tickets. He was there. He clearly loves it, but, you know, he playing with the chip on his shoulder and the, the narrative of letting go, blah, blah, blah. That was, what, seven years ago? Yeah, it was a long time like ago. Enough already. Is in, you know, but signing Cairo Santos and having a good kicking game last year just ended that narrative. And fine, that's good. Uh, you know, and like I said, is I lived through that last, you know, two years of Robbie Gold as a bear. And... He, he was not happy here. He was very outspoken about 
the regime and he wasn't kicking all that well. So I, I get why, you know, I do t- he was making a lot of money too. Yeah. made a lot of money was not kicking. Well, he was, uh, he was very outspoken and you know, th- that's that those are, th- those are like three strikes. You're out. I get it. And bears fans weren't upset when it happened. They were upset when they realized, Oh shit, finding another kicker is not as easy as we thought. You know, had, had we found, you know, a replacement right away, that was fine. Nobody in the world would have been upset about, about, uh, Robbie gold being gone. Even if he, you know, though he did well, they would have just been like, okay, you know, good luck to him. I mean, it was so magnified with Cody Parkey in 2018 and how that whole season ended. Absolutely. But, they, they get, but again, I was more than a few years ago now. So, and, and I always say is don't, don't judge a decision uh, as being wrong because the replacement you brought in was wrong. Right. Like, those are two separate things is, you know, Cody Parkey decision the Robbie gold decision at the time was the right one. And Robbie gold admitted like he had to, he had to come back and find himself again. And sometimes you just don't have that when you're in the same spot. Like you just need that. The change of scenery, change of scenery or that spark, whatever it is. And you need that to, to go find yourself and, and re uh, you know, recommit yourself to, to the, your, your craft. But, that wasn't the wrong decision. The wrong decision, the bad decision was the Cody Parkey decision. And, uh, you know, so just because you made a bad decision afterwards doesn't make the first decision wrong. Exactly. So, I mean, he kicked one field goal today and you didn't hear his name for the rest of the game. That was the last of the 49ers points. Yep. Just gone. Um, One thing we forgot to bring up was I mean, we sort of glossed over it, but uh, early in the game, the 49ers were driving and there was a peanut punch. Mm-hmm. Hits Jaylen, principal. Jalen Johnson. And if you watched, even when they, they weren't knocking it out, they were punching the ball from all angles as guys were running by. And that was huge. And they punched that one out. And that was not an, a bad carried ball. That was... That was a perfectly, you know, held run. And it's just when you punch it perfectly, the ball's oblong. It's it could pop out. You know, you twist a little bit, pops out. And it was a perfect punch. And Jaquan Brisker jumped on it. And that was, you know, Jalen Johnson wearing Peanut Tillman's number. And right, 33. And there you have it. Uh was was really happy with that. And and Peanut Tillman himself tweeted about it. He was very happy about that. Um, and, you know, it's one thing, like every team is going to emphasize trying to get turnovers. But when you make it part of your culture, is a lot different. And that's what the Bears have been doing. Right. When you ingrain into your defenders' heads that you want to make more than the tackle, you want the ball as well. I mean, that's... That's a philosophy that can lead to a lot of good things. And it leads to a lot of players, you know, playing with a bit more energy. I think as cliche and goofy as it sounds. And, you know, some of the, some of the football-y stuff I've heard from Ira Flus is like, oh, this is so cliche, but you know what? If it works, I will happily take it. Yeah. The, the hits principle in name is the biggest grown, you know, cl- cliche type thing but it it works and it's that people are buying into it and he's forcing people to buy into it i was not on board the matt eberflus train when he was hired and the the more i see of him i realize i think that was the right choice he's a real head coach not a defensive guy brought in to fix the defense he was hired to be the CEO of, you know, the field while letting his guys do his jobs. Yes. Is, you know, you, you look and that entire team bought into the hits principle. You saw it on offense. You saw it on defense that they bought 
into it on offense. If you watched, there was uh, a play where um, the defender got in the face of Sam Mustafa and uh, Cody uh, Whitehair jumped in, pushed Mustafa out of the way. And then he got in the guy's face and started driving him back with his face and the guy's face. And, you know, you saw that aggressiveness. You you had you didn't see that previously from Cody Whitehair. You're seeing it now. Tevin Jenkins continue to block on a guy all the way out of bounds after the play was he continued. You saw you see these like the guys are playing tough, not committing penalties, being smart, and uh, and and that is a culture change. That is something that Matt Everflus brought here. That is, you can, you know, he, he has found coaches that wanted to do a system that he wanted, like he wanted his style of defense. So he brought one of his guys with, he wanted a specific type of offense. He got somebody to to bring that type of offense, but the overall philosophy and culture, that is all Eberflus and, you know, there was, there was nothing in this game where I said, "Oh man, he is out, out coached today." No, no. I mean, really, what I'm looking for with Matt Eberflus is so far we've seen the discipline has been great. I mean, that's just been one of the best things that we've seen. You know, we haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I think one of the other things I'm going to be looking for one day is how does he manage clock. How does he manage timeouts in certain situations? What does the two-minute drill look like? Those are all obviously important components of it. But so far, the things that we've wanted to see, that we've had a chance to see him do, you know, we've liked it. We've liked it. We've loved the discipline. We like the fact that they're all buying into this philosophy. I mean, the, the, the whole hits principle thing, if you all are on board with that and you hear your players publicly talking about it, it means they all understand it. There's a there's a difference between saying, oh, I get what he's saying. I'm going to buy into it. But to truly understand it, I think that's a whole other level. And I so far, it seems like they understand it. Everyone's on the same page with that. It is listen to them talk. You had guys saying, you know what? I never thought I loafed in my life until coaches showed me film and said, that's a loaf. That's a loaf. That's a loaf. And guys that worked hard found the holes in what they were doing and they're correcting them on offense on defense is everybody hustled and again this is a team we talked about it before that talent wise on paper wise they they should be one of the worst teams in the NFL but the, what the national media is not seeing is they're not committing penalties. They're playing hard nose football and not making mistakes. That's going to keep them in games. Sure. They're probably going to get run out of the building when they play Buffalo because the Rams who won the Super Bowl last year got run out of the, the building against the, uh, the Buffalo bills. Josh Allen is unbelievable, but any, you know, most of those games, even if they lose, I, I feel like they're going to be in it because they're, they play quality football and they don't shoot themselves in the foot, gives themselves an opportunity. And, you know, as much as we want to shit on, on the talent, we're seeing these young players play really well. They have a fifth round rookie from a small school step in and play left tackle game one against Joey or uh, Nick Bosa and do and hold his own. I mean, Nick Bosa is going to Bosa, but you know, he held his own Um, on the right side. You had two second year players. Uh, You had a, a third year player on playing center second year playing quarterback. You Look had, at Dominic Robinson today. Yeah, he played great. And did you hear him after the game? He said he, at some point, he figured out that the left tackle, the Hall of Fame left tackle for the 49ers had a tell of when it was going to be a run versus a pass. And he figured it out 
and he used it to his advantage. Yeah, I, I, I do kind of wish he didn't say that out loud in the media, but you know what? I, unless we're not we playing, play him in the playoffs again, yeah, we're not going to see him again. We're not playing them again. And But, you know, if, if that was against the Packers, yeah. You know, I hope the coaches go to him like, hey, keep that to yourself if it's the Packers or the Lions or the Vikings um, teams that we play multiple times. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he played really well. What do you have? A sack and a half? Mm-hmm. And he had pressure on. And mm-hmm. I mean, he looked really, really good. So you had two of your defensive rookies really stand out today in Brisker and in Dominic Robinson. Yeah. Gordon, other than that, that one bad play played a pretty neat, decent game. Um, you had a guy that you picked up off waivers and Armand Watts, who played a really nice game in the mm-hmm. center of the line, um, had several pressures. I, you, your, your rookie punter had, you know, some nice punts in terrible conditions. Sure. He got called for illegal toweling, but. Uh, oh, well, oh, well, I mean, but you, you saw, you saw young players stepping up and that's something that the national media can't comprehend because if you don't, if it's not a first round or a high second round or an overpriced free agent that's not they can't comprehend that somebody would would fit that you know fill that hole fill that gap and sure it'll be nice to see uh you know some top flight receivers to compliment darnell mooney but you know what we're making do with what we have like equinemia st brown had a nice game byron pringle had a nice game um, hopefully next week we get to see Valus Jones. That would be nice. That would be really nice. And, you know, I want to have this, this positivity and optimism, but also not get too ahead of myself too. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to start buying playoff tickets. I don't want to start talking about 500 or better yet. I, Cause I mean, look, they beat a good opponent today. They beat an opponent that, last year was a few minutes away from going to the Super Bowl. Okay. This wasn't some nobody team, but you know, that's you're going to play green Bay and green Bay next week. Yeah. And Aaron Rodgers is going to be pissed off. And we know how that ends, you know, especially, so against this, the bears. especially against the bears and you know, your schedule is pretty manageable overall over the next few weeks outside of the green Bay game. But what have we learned from week one? The Colts tied with the Texans. The Texans have a roster that looks like they'd go like one in 16. You know, I mean, you just saw the Giants upset the Titans on the road. You know, that's chaos happens in week one. It, it really does. And week two, a lot of scripts can flip. We could be talking about how even higher we are on the Bears this week, next week at this time, or we could be saying, Yep. Green Bay once again proved that they're miles ahead of us. You know, it's just things change week by week. But if you have reasonable optimism right now for the Bears, it's that you're seeing a team that plays hard, plays with heart. They have a good philosophy with the hits principle. And you have a head coach that has so far kept you fundamentally sound in in terms of not making dumb mistakes. You know, those are all things that matter. You know, I I think... As, as Bears fans, I mean, we've gone after the national media, not because they've said the Bears aren't going to be good. It's their, it's this weird narrative where they don't know, they didn't bother to research. They just said, decided that the Bears were bad because they didn't add the positions in the, you know, our first two picks and our free agency that they thought we should have, that clearly it didn't meant we were going to be terrible. And we went after them because of, You know, like Dominique Foxworth, the bears are in cap hell. They don't have a good cap situation. It's just flat out. Not true. Yeah. It's things like that. We just went after him because like, that's just stupid. Like, do we think if they would have been like, the bears aren't going to be that good. They're not going to be the, the bottom. They're not going to be Jacksonville uh, bad, but they're not going to be green Bay. Good. You know, they're not going to make the playoffs. They're yeah. probably they're probably a six to nine win team. Bears fans have been like, 
okay. Cause you know, and this win is not changing my, my complete outlook. It's, it's one of those games that I felt the bears were ripe for an upset and, and they did. And it was a little different than I expected it to be, but this was the the, the upset they got. You know, it's not, it completely not changing my outlook on the season. Maybe it means that they go from instead of, uh, you know, seven wins, they go to eight. But it's that same window, six to nine wins that I right, pre- right. I predicted. I nothing has changed, but you know, seeing the Bears have figure some things out and beat a quality opponent definitely is something that's important. And they, they ended up taking on this challenge and they won. And there, was it a clean game? No, even on defense, uh, they need to be able to fix those, those holes in the run game. Uh, yeah, they, Samuel they, yeah. on the ground really struggled. I don't think, Roquan Smith had a particularly great game. He wound up with a lot of tackles, but um, I, I think I think it was clear that he missed not having preseason. And training yeah, camp. there was a little bit of rust on him. You could definitely tell he wasn't there the whole time in training camp. And, you know, you saw some plays like letting Trey Lance, I think it was like third and 12 rush for a first down. Like that, that just can't happen. Yeah, there were several of those where, you know, you had thought you had the whole thing bottled up and it ended up being a positive play and nothing killer. Like, you know, last year when you saw like, oh, the guys were bottled up and then ran for 30 yards. You didn't see that situation, but still you need to make sure you're wrapping up. There's this is a continuing continuous learning process and. uh, Like instituting this new system and new philosophy, it's all every week you just want to get better and better and Roquan's going to get better as he, as he plays more and more. Right. And, um, you know, you saw Kyler Gordon make, make a few, uh, you know, rookie mistakes, but you know what? He's a rookie. <laughs> like your rookies are going to make rookie mistakes. It yeah. There's going to be some growing pains is, and we, we all knew that we all knew that he would, like some great plays and then you'd make some rookie mistakes and that's part of playing a rookie. And we all knew that is playing a lot of these young players for all the excitement we get from man, look at, we have going forward and to look forward to as they get, they grow and get better and grow into their primes. We also have to live with, oof, like, you know, when Braxton, Braxton Jones got fooled by Bosa and bowled over, you know, the same thing with the, with Gordon, with that long pass, like we have to live with those. And as long as they're not the same things over and over and we're seeing him, them happen less frequently and less, even more or less frequently, then we can live with that. It just is, it's, we can't live with it when it continuously happens or doesn't get better. Right. Exactly. Um, but the, the run defense I think needs to, tighten up uh i think we're going to get a big dose of that next week with the packers Mm -hmm. um because i don't think aaron Rodgers trusts them and i think the packers are going to view this game as hey let's contain the bears on offense and get a lead and then run the ball down their throats Mm -hmm. that that's going to be their what they want to do and the bears in order to do that are they're gonna have to score early or stop the run and make Aaron Rodgers beat them with the pass, which we, we know he can do. It's can those receivers do it? Um, you know, we've never, we've never been a team to dare Aaron Rodgers to beat us in the air, but without Devonte Adams and without, you know, some of their stud receivers of the past, maybe it's time to do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, on offense, you hope that Lucas Patrick can get that cast off his hand and, and start snapping the ball because if you can get him back at center and then get your five guys out there and then build continuity, that's going to help you as the season goes on too. Exactly. Yep. Um, but, you know, 
I was just, I was very happy that this game turned around because if we would have had a second half, like the first half, I would have been an angry Sean instead of continuing to sip on my Kool-Aid Sean. Yeah. You would have been puke stilt Sean. Bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> you would have gone to soldier field. You would have tried to get on the stilts and then the stilts would start sinking into the wet ground. <laughs> You'd be furiously like shaking the stilts all the way up there, trying to get it to move. And it just won't budge. I would have had to put my stilts in like big rubber boots. <laughs> you have like rope at the top, like tying the boots on. Uh, it's like sloshing through and stilts on boots. <laughs> uh, uh, that field probably sounded like uh, trying to carry a, uh, John Lackey's spittoon out of the out of the game. Ew. <laughs> Once again, you have to take it from like a two to a ten. Okay, maybe more like a four to a ten or a five to a ten, but still. Uh, but you're probably right. I mean, you're you're honestly probably right. And I I love the fact that Bears Twitter has just eaten that sliding slip and slide thing they did after the final play alive because. The photos they have of that are great of Justin Fields and all the guys just sliding. Yeah. You had the footage from the television broadcast. You had a bunch of uh, like photographs from the tribune and other outlets posting really cool photos of that as they're splashing through. It's that was really a fun moment, but when that was happening live, I was just like, okay, don't, don't twist a, a, an ankle or a wrist or don't, you know, crack a rib or, do something, but you know, all's well that ends well. And it was a really fun moment. Yeah. Like I think, I think we got out of this game without injuries. Yeah. All you really saw was you saw Jalen Johnson shooken up a little bit, but he was fine. He was fine. He played. I think, I think it was just a, you know, a little ankle thing, but he ended up being fine. Um, You know, Justin Fields, when he got that hit, the other guy took the brunt of it. Right. Is he got taken off uh, for a concussion check. But it was funny because when the, the, the refs walked him off, the one started motioning to the sideline and they started knocking on his own head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but all in all, I'm, I'm happy with the result. I'm happy with a lot of things, definitely a lot of things that need to get cleaned up, but mm-hmm. that's, that's, it's good it's good position to have to win and have a lot of things to clean up, then carry that as a loss and try to clean those things up because it just changes the, the whole mood about it. Exactly. The players are more fired up about it. There's more confidence in the locker room and in Hallis hall. And, you know, when you see the energy that they give off when they win games like that, it's, you know, you're, you're watching them and you see a team that, wants to give a hundred percent. And when you win, you want to give even more again, it's really cliche. It's really cheesy, but man, it just, it feels like winning today's game was a, a noticeable step for the future. Yeah. And you know, I I tweeted it out, but it doesn't matter if Justin Fields would have thrown for 400 yards and five touchdown passes and they intercepted, Trey Lance 15 times like versus the way that this happened is it still goes in as a single win in the win column. And there's no, there's no asterisks next to it. It's a win. And um, you take them however you get them. They're tough to get in the NFL and you, and you go, all right, we got this win. Wasn't pretty. We would like to be better at this win. Let's find the issue. Let's pat ourselves on the back for the things we did well and correct the things that we didn't do well to make ourselves better for next week. Exactly. Uh, so next week at Green Bay should be should be a uh, a doozy. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you know we've got no matter what happens, the Bears. The Bears will not be behind the Packers in the uh, in the standings. 
<laughs> yeah, and we don't have to deal with them passing them up us up as all time wins after beating us. Um, yeah, because they would talk about that nonstop. It would be not. Yeah, exactly. The funniest thing is I saw somebody tweet out a picture of the standings after the game was over, and because the Packers and Vikings were playing each other, and so it had Bears one and zero. Packers Vikings 0 and 0 and the Lions 0 and 1 and they just put stop the count. Yeah, I think that was Bleacher Nation Bears that tweeted that stop the count. <laughs> that was great. Uh Meanwhile, uh, we have the AFC South. Texans 0 0 and 1, Colts 0 0 and 1, Titans 0 and 0 and 1, Jaguars 0 and 1. Man, the Jaguars are bad. They I, I watched part of that game. That team is not good. They need a lot of help. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. You know, p- people will say, oh, the Bears need a lot of help. The we Jaguars, do, but the we, Jaguars, holy crap. Is, is I, I feel like even though we need help, we've got better placeholders than they do. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, should we move on to a little bit of baseball here? Why don't we? Uh, so Tony Larusa has been out with medical issues for a bit and the White Sox have been playing fantastic baseball for the mm-hmm. most part mm-hmm. and scoring um, runs like crazy and everyone's hitting and, and full of energy and life immediately, immediately Tony Larusa comes back, puts Lurie Garcia in the lineup. And the White Sox stop scoring, scoring runs and get destroyed by Oakland. Well, he's not actually in the dugout, though, right? He's with the team, but he's not managing. It just, I, he's just a bad juju. Well, it's kind of fun. Like, you know what I picture them today? They're in the dugout and they're feeling good. And then all of a sudden they all smell something really, really bad. And they look over. It's just Tony La Russa. <laughs> It's like the crypt keeper in the corner, <laughs> except without good puns. <laughs> exactly. So even though he wasn't managing, he was with the team and, you know, he, uh, he was there. I think Ricky Henderson was there today. So, you know, there was a little thing he showed himself for the Oakland fans. Cause you know, he won a world series with Oakland. He was a great manager for Oakland after his first since with the white Sox and before he went to St. Louis. So yeah, he was there and yeah, it, it, it didn't go as well because the first three games, the White Sox, to say they steamrolled the A's is kind of an understatement. And boy, you want to talk about the uh, Elvis Andrews revenge tour against the A's. You saw it. Yep. I mean, today it stopped, but he's been a great pickup for the White Sox. And, you know, I don't want to throw too much credit towards Rick Hahn. I mean, he he made the move. Uh, I'm sure because there was Anderson other... was out. Yeah, I mean it. It was it was the most obvious connection that he wanted out of Oakland. Needed he wanted more playing time. The White Sox can give him that playing time by saying, "Hey, look, our dude is out for a while. You will take his spot, and then when he does come back, we'll just move you to second base, and you'll continue that playing time because we have a big hole there." And it was, it was a, you know, the uh, most obvious marriage that you could have, but there was other teams that wanted him as well. The, the credit, I guess you got to give Rick Hahn is he was able to get him. Um, but it was, it was a very obvious pickup and, and it has turned out as good as expected. And, you know, you have two, two castaways that have really fueled you this year. And Johnny Cueto, even though he had a shitty game today, uh, and Elvis Andrus, the, who have been phenomenal and way, way outplaying their their pay, which is funny because usually we've seen the the White Sox make those kind of moves where we bring in those type of guys, and they're just really, really not effective at all. You know, guys that were once big names four or five years ago, which applies to both Johnny Cueto and Elvis Andrus, and you know, normally. Nor I, I think for both those guys, nobody had any expectations. Like Cueto and Andrews, at the time they were brought in, it was all just a body, just a warm body to fill a spot. But they've legit been great for the White Sox. And, it's you know, sometimes you just find diamonds in the rough. 
Yeah. And I mean, you know what? And, and the Elvis Andrus one situation, even if he wasn't hitting just him coming in defensively and being able to play lead off, like that was, you could live with that. Yeah. Um, but he's, his bat's been pretty solid and, um, you know, so it's, it's everything you could have asked for and more. Exactly. And when you see, you know, your big guys like Aloy Jimenez keeps hitting, like he's hitting like crazy lately. He's been really, really good at that. And you see just different guys coming up with big hits in different situations. It makes you feel better and better about this team in the, the final, final weeks. And you just got to keep at it. You got to keep at it. You don't want to take your foot off the gas. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're really just chasing Cleveland now. Minnesota's toast. They're, they're done. They're squished. They're, feed them to the crows. It's really just you and Cleveland now. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you were praying for, for the Twins to win a couple of games here, but they, uh, they just couldn't do it. Um, right. And, the guardians just really, really hammered them. And, and uh, the twins are toast. And we've been saying this, that it was, it was a matter of when, not if and exactly it, it surprisingly held, you know, way longer than anyone would have expected. But, uh, it really it, only held because of that division. Right. Um, but you know, whites that now, now twins are four and a half games out. And the White Sox are two and a half. Um, yeah, so count the count the twins out basically at this point, I would say. Yes. Yeah. They're they're so toast. It's just now can you can you uh make more ground up on the tw- the twins because or I mean on the uh, guardians, because we are run out of real estate here. Yeah, I mean, you have what four more games left with them? Yeah, I mean, you I beat them. So. If you beat them and take them over, then you win the division. I mean, obviously, you need to keep it up. But if you took three or four, then, I mean, that's massive. It is absolutely massive. And, you know, it's it's going to be a tight battle to the end, I think. You know, no matter how this ends, I just, you know, I really like what Cleveland does. I think they're a very fundamentally sound team with talent. But I just, I think the White Sox are more talented. And if they keep this momentum going, then they, they'd be the one I'd pick to win the division. But, you know, like we've said every time on the show, you got to go out and do it. Yeah. And I mean, what are we around 20, 21 games left or so? Yeah. And um, with that, with two and a half back, that's not, not a lot that you're right there. You are absolutely right there. Yeah. One day could get you all that closer or could give you another step back. Yeah. You got, so you got uh two this week against the Rockies who are not a good team. Oh, they're terrible. Then you got a makeup game versus the guardians, which I think that's a big one. Yeah. Cause if Cleveland wins that one, then they have the tiebreaker. Uh, if they, so, the, the, if the, if they win, I, I believe the white Sox have to sweep in order to get the tiebreaker. And the, then you get, uh, you get three against Detroit to wrap up the weekend. Yeah. And you're like, all right, here we go. We could make up this ground right away. And then after that, it's three more against the guardians and then three more or three more against the tigers. So you have like all your games for the next pretty much two weeks are either against the dregs of the, of baseball or the team that you're chasing. Like this is prime opportunity for you to catch up. Yeah. I mean, there, this is so favorable for the white Sox. This is, this is a situation where they are in prime position to take this over and win this division. It really is. I mean, honestly, I don't even think with how, how favorable the, the, the schedule is, um, you know, these last uh, this the next two weeks is I don't even think you have to make up ground head to head versus Cleveland. If you, I mean, it would be nice if, if, you, if you swept Cleveland, you know, you're, you're moonwalking into that division title, but right. You should be able to, to tie this up just 
just through normal course of, of winning these games. And if you split the Cleveland series. Yeah. Yeah. It, you're right. Um, I, th- I mean, I think it's all set up fine for them. Even with everything you went through for the first five months, they're still in prime to win the division, even being two and a half back. It just, you, you gotta, you gotta it, make sure that you're not blowing games. Right. That are winnable. Right. Exactly. Like that's, that's just really important. You're very um, lucky to be in this position. You got to take advantage of it. Oh yeah. I mean, you, you have to, if you're the white Sox. You have to just be praying to the baseball gods every day that, that you're in a terrible division because th- this is, uh, this is a bad division that you've, you've been able to play barely over 500 baseball and stay in this race all the way to the end. Right. Um, exactly. You know, if the, the white Sox playing their three games over 500, if they are three games over 500 in the AL East, they're only ahead of the Red Sox. Right. They are behind the Yankees, the Rays, the Blue Jays, and the Orioles. Um, if they're third, they're third in the AL West. And uh, they're fourth in the NL East. They're third in the NL Central. And third in the NL West, like you, you know, and you're, and you're in the race for the, the AL central. So every day, you know, pour some rum out for the, the baseball gods. Yeah. And you have to see this as an opportunity. You don't want to say, Hey, luck is uh, keeping this in this. Thanks. Luck. You gotta be like, well, we're in this position We're we need to take full advantage of this. We need to make the most of this. Because once you get in, a lot of things can happen in October. A lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. That's it, It's a reset. Like baseball is so weird. Every other sport is like a more concentrated version of the regular season. Baseball, it's it's like a, what is the, the, the triathlon where it's like you're doing one thing and then you completely switch to something else. That's mm-hmm. really what baseball is like. You're just like, Oh, Hey, the, the regular season is, is my, you know, 10 mile swim. And then now I got to ride a bicycle for the, the playoffs. It's a completely different animal, same sport, but it's just the, the way you win during that long regular season versus the way that you win in the postseason are just completely different. And you play completely different baseball Construct your roster completely different. And, you know, the White Sox, the, you know, once you get into the postseason, it's just reset. Who cares what happened in the regular season? It's all fresh. Exactly. Other side of town, Cubs are not making the playoffs. <laughs> no, no, they're not. Uh, they're just, you know, I, like, I've reached the apathetic level of this season. Like just get it over with pretty much. It's like, are they the dregs? No. Are they anywhere near good? No. And you know, it's, it's just, these games are sort of just happening. At least we got to see a glimpse of Hayden Wisniewski the other night who was just throwing filth. He was throwing filth and I am excited to see what the 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 pitch lab is going to do with him and and because if that's if that guy is throwing that stuff regularly we got a stud on our hands. Yeah, I mean that slider is just unbelievably nasty and it's more the kind of stuff you want. Hard slider, good fastball, you want more of that in your system, you want to develop it properly. So that would be a big big step forward to have him be successful. And, you know, watching Miko Horner has been a lot of fun. He continues to do things. Uh, you know, Say has been hitting a bit better lately. Ian Happ has been solid, not spectacular, but solid. Um, you know, Wilson Contreras being hurt is kind of a bummer. But, I mean, look, you don't have a really good bullpen anymore. I mean, your bullpen is basically just a, a hodgepodge of what you had in AAA where, you know, it's not going to be a factor on the big league level going forward. So you're blowing a lot of games and 
you know, you're just like at the point, it's like, well, these games don't mean anything. And you just, you know, you watch the prospects continue to grow. You're seeing some of the young guys get some time up in the majors here. And then other than that, you're like, all right, well, okay, just, you know, we're not going anywhere. These games don't mean anything. Just a few more weeks and we can get to the off season. Pretty much. Um, but question long-term, where do you see Christopher Morrell fitting on this team going forward? I think he's kind of a bench platoon guy, honestly. He's not a regular everyday guy, I don't think. It, it, it sucks. It's been a nice story. He's had some some good ups. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure he's had some downs, but he's had some good ups. and Easy to root for, great guy. And yeah, and I just, every time I see him, I'm just like, he's a guy that I would love to figure it out regularly because I would love for him to be a regular contributor. But as it stands, if he's a regular contributor, you are not sniffing the playoffs. Right. I mean, he should be in there in certain matchups in certain times. Uh, you know, defensively, he's got a great arm, but he's struggled defensively in center field. And in, you know, at first the throwing or at third, the throwing's a little whack at times, but you know, every now and then we'll still see him come up with something big and he kind of lights an energy with the team that seems to kind of go across. And, you know, I want him to succeed. I want him to be good. I just, I, I don't think it's realistic to expect him to be one of your prime everyday guys going forward. I want him to be part of the team. It's just, he's going to have a certain role. Right. Um, I just, you know, he's, I wouldn't call him a quadruple a player, but no. he's, he's not an everyday major league player either. Right. Um, and, you know, we have Tom Ricketts talking about, multiple times about how this team is going to spend in free agency, but what are they going to do? What, what is the plan? I mean, if money was no object, obviously you would try to bring in a stud shortstop and Nolan Arenado to play third and a frontline pitcher and re-sign Wilson Contreras. But you know, just because you spend big does not mean you're spending unlimited either. Right, exactly. And, you know, I think, too, we have to maybe realize that things being on the table could also mean trading prospects for big names. I don't think we can rule that out necessarily. Um, we can't rule that out, but I think we need to. This is where you know, you have scouting that scouts the minors. I mean, uh, the, you know, for the draft and international, and then you have pro pro scouting, which is scouting for T players. You're going to sign for free agents or trade for, but I really think you need to understand the players that you have, because I think that is, um, you know, when, when you make a trade from your farm system, is the the big fear is you trade for a pitcher that you know isn't exactly what you thought you were getting and you end up trading away a, a Cy Young winner. <clears throat> um but I think that's your fear. But uh you know that's why I feel like you really need to know your own minor league system so well and and understand you know, where you see the ceiling for players. And, you know, if, if you feel like, Hey, you know, this guy has nasty stuff. We just don't think he's ever going to get the control. We've tried everything and you know what, we're going to give up on him. We're fine trading him, even though this guy's got nasty stuff. And if that guy ends up being awesome, then you're like, okay, well then they figured out something that we couldn't do. And you can live with that. You just want to make sure that you are scouting your own players, especially when you're in a position where maybe you're going to trade from your farm system for established players to build yourself. Then, you know, 
you need to make sure that you're you're getting the player that you wanted and you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul and giving up the future for the present. Yeah, and I think they do. I, I think they understand what they have. I think they they have an idea of what they want to. I think they would much rather trade away some of those position players for other position players and arms. Cause I really think they want to grow the arms from within, not saying they're not going to acquire more arm talent, but I think that is kind of their big focus here is growing through the farm system, especially with the pitching. Um, yeah. So I just, um, I, I'm not saying, you know, trading from your farm system to to get major league talent is wrong. It's just making sure that you're getting a player that is really going to help you long term, uh, and and not not trading away from the future. Right, right. Um, I, I just don't know what's realistic for this team for next year. Yeah. I think more of that will kind of come out once the off season starts, maybe we get a better idea of where we're going to go, but you know, right now you just kind of got to finish the season and then see how things play out. I guess. It's just real tough to see a path to being a really good team. When you all already know that you're going to be taking a step back before you take a step forward in getting rid of Wilson Contreras. Right. No, I agree. It, it's a, a tough, tough sell. It was like, I get it. Like if you, if you would have traded him away and you're like, okay, I get it. You're, you, you didn't expect to resign him or, you know, whatever, but they just, there's not a plan in place for a replacement for Wilson Contreras. And so automatically, you know, even if the philosophy is, Hey, listen, we we're going to go the Astros route and just assume no hitting from the catcher position, just a really good catcher. It's just, who is that guy? Right. Um, yeah. yeah. You got to replace that. So it's, it's, you're taking a step back before you take a step forward. And, and that's just a tough sell to the fans, especially after the last couple seasons. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, realistically, I don't know what, what they can do to, to take that step to be in the conversation with the Cardinals for next year. Is there anything? Well, you know, I think it's going to depend a lot of, you know, not only who you acquire, but. I think you're also going to have to look at a situation where you say, you know what, we need some of our prospects to come up and hit right away. Like you need a Jordan Wicks to hit, come up and pitch well. You need Wesneski to start, you know, to continue to keep looking good. And maybe even a Brendan Davis. It's it's going to be a combination of a lot of things. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it does that conversation start with Brennan Davis coming up and playing well? I mean, I think that that's very important sooner than later um you know although he didn't have the season i think he hoped or anybody hoped he had the fact that he came back from the back surgery and uh and rose up the ranks real quick says something i think so too um so that would be that would be a huge, huge step up. Um, I'm still on the fence of I think they're gonna they're gonna move Ian Happ. I mean, I don't want to move him, but we'll see. Uh, I still think frontline pitcher, and and a a left side of the infield power bat that can field whether that be a, a Nolan Arenado or a Carlos Correa um I think I think that's necessary 
I want Trey Turner if that's at all possible. That's who I want. I think Correa is kind of overrated. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying is somebody that. Oh yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, that type of echelon player. Um, uh, you know, I mean, can you imagine though if they they were able to pry Nolan Arenado and Trey Turner? That would be awesome. That would be that huge step forward. You know, if Brennan Davis comes up and is able to be rookie of the year conversation uh, and those two guys and a front end starter, that's, that's a big, that's a big step forward. That puts you in the conversation for division. Yeah, absolutely. But um, which would be a huge, huge, uh, you know, step up from this year. Because I don't know about you. These games have just been tough. I, I find yeah, myself. Yeah. I, I haven't even watched a game in a while. I listen. I listen on the radio mm-hmm. doing, doing other stuff. I do too. Um, yeah. I listen a lot. And, uh, you know, I can just, you know, if I'm in the car driving somewhere, running errands, I pop out, not worried about missing anything, pop back in. I like Pat and Ron. Um, and makes it easier to, to, to swallow sometimes when you're not watching it happen. It's just a really, if, if it's sad, I've lost a lot of the, the excitement about watching the Cubs this year. And, you know, there's other years where you watch out of spite where you're just mad. And sometimes you watch out of joy and excitement. This is just kind of. Mm, yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I, I feel that. Yeah. So Tough, tough, tough. Uh, Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think I've said my piece today. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Uh, I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Uh, Please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify, et cetera. Uh, share this podcast with your friends. That's how we grow the show. Follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com, at Shy Fan Pat 2 for Alex on Twitter, and Alexander J Pat Creative.com for all the cool stuff that Alex does. And again, thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good luck! We thank Dick uh, and God for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on planes. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the bears go bearing down.